Great. Good morning. Yes, uh, it's really good to be with you. Thanks, Makeda and Jack, for leading us so well in worship. Also, thanks to Mona and Julie. Uh, and uh, yeah, well done for handling that mic issue. Um, but yeah, as, as they just said, I'm going to be carrying on our series this morning called Resilient. And we're working our way through the book of Ephesians. And the title for this morning's message is this, Resilient Hope. Yeah, big, big topic, but hope is a commodity, actually, that in this world at the moment, it seems to be very fleeting. We as humans need hope to live, to function, and hope is the desire for something good to happen to us in the future. And I'm sure we can all agree that's something that we all want in life. And I'm sure right now, maybe a lot of us are living in hope that one day in the, in the future that we'll be out of lockdown Maybe there's a good number of parents right now hoping schools might open sooner rather than later. And we place hope in so many different things, don't we? At the moment, vaccines, maybe change of governments, maybe you're hoping for a pay rise, maybe you're hoping for a new relationship. And the problem is, is when we place hope in the things of this world, they're often found to not meet our expectations, actually, to be unstable. They might be good for a little while, but ultimately they'll let us down and Many of us know this, this verse, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I'm sure we also know how that feels. There's nothing like having the promise of something good being taken away from us. At whatever level in life it is, whether you're 2, 20 or 80. So how do you have hope? How do you live a life where hope stays no matter what the circumstances? And hopefully, pun intended, out of this morning's message, we will, we will discover the answer. This, this series is based in Ephesians, and I've got a great passage to unpack today, actually. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. So why don't you go, grab your Bibles, and we're going to read it together. It's this, Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Brilliant passage, isn't it? And this passage is so rich, actually, and there's something in it for everyone. Whether you believe in Jesus this morning or whether you're just looking in, God wants to speak to you today. Why don't you just take a moment to open your heart to him and say, God, speak to me. If you're there, speak to me. So coming back to this passage, first of all, as always, when we read the Bible, context is everything. It's important to realise that this chapter two actually follows on from chapter one. Now, I know that's obvious. But actually, the way in which Paul writes his letters to the different churches in the New Testament is important to understand as we look at this book. The normal structure is this. So he'll first present an argument and then he'll work it through to how we as Christians should behave, should act, should change, etc. And we'll see that actually as we journey through this series over the coming weeks, that pattern of an argument and then how do we apply it to our lives. But coming back to today, we need to know what Paul was saying in chapter 1, actually, as it directly leads to chapter 2. These two things are linked. It was one letter that Paul wrote. Now, Andy and Dan both did a fantastic job of unpacking it over the last couple of weeks. But to summarise, basically to sum up their preachers in, in one, one verse, we can look at the 10th verse of chapter 1. Ephesians 1, verse 10 it says this, As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. That really is the heart of Ephesians. That's the main message. God's plan to unite all things in Christ, to restore things actually back to how they were designed to be. And that has to include and does include how we as humans, how we as the human race relate to God. 
And that's got to be the lens in which we come to read chapter 2 today. In the verses we are in, Paul is unpacking, he's telling the story, the process of salvation. And actually by doing that, it will bring us into a deeper revelation of the power of God. So let's get into it. My first point, helpless and hopeless. Paul, the writer of this book, starts off this passage looking at the state of humanity without the intervention of God sending Jesus for us. And we can see that in verses 1 of 1 to 3. It says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The before and after photos. I'm sure you've all seen those photos online, haven't you? Of people having gone through a weight loss journey. They'll post a photo of what they look like right at the start, normally rather large. And then at the end, they'll post another photo uh, of a very thin person and displaying this incredible turnaround. And Paul here right now is, is he's showing us the, the before picture. You see, mankind doesn't start life in neutral terms with God. The doctrine of sin, the understanding that we by nature are sinful beings and fall sure of God's standard is actually something that we all have to come to an understanding of. It, it helps us understand the world that we live in, actually. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, you cannot understand the whole of human history apart from, uh, from this, with all its quarrels and its conquests, its calamities and all that it records, I assert that there is no adequate explanation save in the biblical doctrine of sin. The history of the world can only be understood truly in the light of this great biblical doctrine of man, fallen and in sin. So humanity, by its very nature, is sinful. Actually, that's because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and because of that, we are all born under that curse. We're separate from God. And the essence, actually, of temptation in the Garden of Eden was that Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the fruit would make you wise. That's the heart of what happened there. And actually, in 1 John 2, verse 16, this is summed up with a definition of sin, of the sin of Eden being the lust of the eyes. She saw something that she wanted. The lust of the flesh, she took it and she ate it. And the pride of life, I'm going to do it, even though I've been told no. The temptation was given into, actually, which meant the human race was condemned to a sinful nature that was governed by living by what we see, what we desire to satisfy us, and living by our own philo philosophy of life rather than God's. We can see that in the world that we live in. This is the root of sin in human nature that separates us from God. And to restrain humanity's sinful desires, God gave us laws, which we see in the Old Testament, to show God's standard of holiness. But because of our now sinful nature, we seem incapable, actually, of keeping those laws, don't we? So Eden defines our sinful nature, and God's law defines our sinful behaviour. Sin is therefore in our nature, which results us in breaking God's law and falling short of his standard of holiness. We're lost. We're lost. And not only are we lost, because we're sinful, we are dead. And actually, Paul outlines that right at the start of this chapter. And you were dead. It's a pretty stark message. Now, Paul here isn't saying that we're physically dead. Obviously not. I'm speaking to you right now. No, he's making a point that we were spiritually dead. We were dead to God. We were helpless, hopeless in that state. You see, the life of someone that doesn't follow Jesus, that hasn't given their life over to him and accepted him as their Lord and Saviour, is actually one of living death. And someone that is dead has no power to change anything. They're completely helpless in that state, aren't they? And remember, we're talking here about spiritual death. A question you can ask then is, well, what's the alternative? What, what's, the, what's the flip side to spiritual death? What's spiritual life? What could that look like? And the Bible, as always, helpfully has an answer for that. It's great for that. It says in John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, to know God is to live. 
and to not know him is to be dead. It's that simple. And if you are a Christian today, you were dead. This was your state before Jesus came into your life. You were dead. Not only were you dead, actually Paul goes on here, he says that we were following the prince of the power of the air. Okay, so we not only were dead, we were actually being disobedient to God. We were actively going against God. You see, we didn't know that. We didn't know we were dead. A dead person doesn't know they're dead. We, we didn't know the direction of travel. And let me just, I'm going to tell a little story, hopefully, that will help illustrate this as we try and grasp this concept together. So um, it's in, we were all in lockdown, aren't we? And as part of this lockdown, I decided, right, it's time to get fit. I'm not going to do what I did last lockdown, which is put on a little bit of weight, but now I'm going to, I'm going to keep it off. I'm going to get ex- go and kind of exercise. And I've got an e-bike, a mountain bike, e-bike, electric bike, which is brilliant fun. And uh, part of this lockdown, I've been going on for ride, going for rides. And I've discovered recently in Horsham, we are, we've got, we're very blessed with the countryside that we live in. And there's this forest called St. Leonard's Forest. Now, this was a revelation to me. I had not known this was here before lockdown. And I've discovered it, and it's massive, it's great fun, it's great for riding bikes in. And, uh, and I normally do a circuit, about 10 miles or so. Um, and so it was a really rainy week, and the Sunday, it was, it was dry, it was sunny, I thought, right, I'm going out for a bike ride. So off I went, out on a bike ride. And I had a little bit of time, so I thought this, rather than doing my usual route that I knew, I thought I just saw a little side track going off, and I heard lots of stories about St. Leonard's Forest being great for mountain bike tracks. So I thought, I'm going to go test myself. I'm going to go down this track. You can see where this, head, this is heading. So I, I turn, turn right, go down this tiny little track, go down the hill. It's great fun, weaving in and out the trees, feeling like a proper mountain biker. I'm really not. Um, and then it got steeper and steeper. And that's when the fear started creeping in more and more and more. I started feeling at the extent of my abilities as a a cyclist. And it got steeper, steeper, steeper. And then right at the end, I just came to a sudden halt because I hit this, you know, soup of wet, sticky clay mud. Must have been about a foot thick dead stop. And I almost, almost went straight over uh, my bike. Fortunately, I didn't. Now, with e-bikes, they're great because you can turn on a motor and it helps you get out of whatever trouble you're in. If you want to go up a hill fast, you can do that. So I thought, ah, it's going to be fine. I'm at the bottom of this hill in this kind of valley, but it'd be all right, I'll be able to get back up with the bike. Sat on the bike, started riding, no traction whatsoever. In fact, the, the, the mud was so thick that it clogged the whole bike up. So there's me, the bottom of this hill. The other thing that I realised at that point was I was wearing some old trainers because I didn't think I was going to walk, I thought I was going to ride. And these trainers literally had no grip on whatsoever. So I was at the bottom of a hill with a really heavy bike with trainers that had no grip. And I spent the next probably 45 minutes, uh, maybe to an hour, climbing back up this hill, falling over. I was literally covered in mud. The bike was covered in mud. I, I actually met a couple at the top of the hill and they must have been wondering, what on earth has this guy been doing? She's been bathing in mud. So Paul is saying here in this passage, like I was saying like I was actually when I was riding down that hill. We were lost, didn't know where I was going. But not only that, we were merrily lost. We were happily descending down deeper into a life of separation from God. Just like I descended that hill, not knowing what was going to happen. You see, Paul talks about the fact that we were following the prince of the power of the air. It's a funny phrase that, the spirit of disobedience. So what does he mean there? Well, he's talking about Satan. And it's a bit like this, to go back to my bike ride, Satan is a little bit like gravity, actively pulling us deeper down the hill, into the pit, away from home, away from God, but without us really realising it. You see, humanity on its own will always end up choosing the wrong direction. But what's worse is that we'll actually believe it's the right one. God is holy and cannot stand sin. And because we're sinful, because of our sinful nature, we then become objects of his wrath, rightly so. We are enemies of God. So where is the hope for us then? How can we hope today if that is our state? As Paul writes, well, it's coming. But... God. Now, I like a big but in the Bible, and uh, we read actually in verse 4, and we read verse 4 to 7. Let's just find that together. It says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us him with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful passage that is. In the light of what we've just been talking about, our state before God, this cannot be anything other than the greatest of statements we can ever hope to hear. It's incredible. Jesus changes the story. It was God's love that sent Jesus. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son. And William Hendrickson, a commentator, says this, says, this love of God is so great that it defies all definition. Now, uh, it's a wonderful phrase, but I've got an impossible job this morning then to adequately describe his love. It's impossible to comprehend, but... Uh, When God's love is directed towards us, sinful humanity, and all our horrendous, disgusting state of sin that we've been hearing about and talking about, that love, that great love, becomes God's mercy. You see, the mercy of God is as rich as his love for us is great. The mercy of God is as rich as his love for us is great. Salvation from death is only found at the cross. It's the greatest display of the mercy of God. It was there that our punishment for living a life in disobedience to God was given over to Jesus, God's own son. Remember, the wages of sin are death. The death that he died was the death that we deserved. Remember about sin, our nature and and God's law, the fact that we break it? Well, Jesus didn't have a sinful nature and he didn't break any of God's laws. And so by doing that, he became our substitute. And Fleming Rutledge in her book, The Crucifixion, says this, God made Jesus to be sin, even though he knew no sin. And in that indescribably terrible and unique transaction, Jesus apparently felt the full force of utter separation from the Father. That is what he underwent in order to remake our human nature, not to improve it, not to accept it, not even to perfect it, but to re-engender it altogether. He became sin. We became the righteousness of God. And that word re-engender means to regenerate. It means to be brand new, to be a brand new person, no longer an enemy of God, actively working against God, but now because of Jesus, entirely righteous. And that word righteous means to act in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. This is huge. That separation, that place of hopelessness has been exchanged for connection now. We are made right with God. So we can know him. We can enjoy him. We can relate and commune with him. And that in and of itself is is incredible and worthy of so much more time now than I have. But God didn't stop there. When you become a Christian, you become in Christ. It's a funny phrase, so let's talk about that. What does that mean? John Stott says, the commonest description in the scriptures of a follower of Jesus is that he or she is a person in Christ. The expressions in Christ, in the Lord and in him occur 164 times in the letters of Paul alone, which we're in at the moment, and are indispensable to an understanding of the New Testament. To be in Christ does not mean to be inside Christ as tools are in a toolbox, or clothes in a closet, but to be organically united to Christ, as a limb is in the body or a branch is in the tree. It is this personal relationship with Christ that is the distinctive mark of his authentic followers. It's a great explanation there. So to be in Christ means we now share in his death. We've already said he took our punishment. We share in his resurrection. We've been made alive because he was raised but also we share in his ascension. We have been raised up. We are now seated in the heavenly places. Verse six says this, says, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what are the heavenly places? Well, it's where God especially manifests his presence and his glory. It's the abode, it's the home of God. It's where the Lord Jesus Christ in his glorified body now dwells. So that's where we are. Do you see the progression that Paul has taken us on? It's quite a a, a big one, actually. Rather than being under the power of Satan, following the course of this world to destruction, remember that picture of going down that hill, 
that has been exchanged for us now to be under the rule and reign of heaven. We are new creations. We live actually in a different world. We belong in a different place now. We're citizens of heaven and our outlook, our lens on life should be entirely different because of it actually. Charles Spurgeon says, we are not only raised from the dead with Christ, but we are spiritually raised into the heavenly places with him. It is a great thing when a man learns to look up from heaven, look up from earth to heaven. It is a greater thing when he learns to look down from heaven upon earth. To have you sitting at the right hand of God and then look down on all the things of this present life as far below you. That change of perspective is so important. You see, the unbeliever is a person entirely controlled by the spirit of the world, the thing that we're living in. And they, whereas the Christian actually is a person who has victory over that now. We have victory over the world we live in. And Paul prays in Ephesians 1.16 that the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, would have the eyes of their hearts enlightened so they would know the hope to which they've been called. Oh, that we would have the eyes of our heart enlightened more to this hope, this resilient, enduring, steadfast hope that changes everything. The fact that we are in Jesus this morning. Do you get it? Do you know it? Does it affect your life? It has to. But maybe this morning you're like a a spiritual Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You're flipping between resisting sin for a while, doing well, and then coming back under it and almost giving yourself to it, living under the influence of the world. And then suddenly coming to your your senses and realising that you're, oh yeah, I'm not a slave to this, but I am a new creation. Then coming back again and you live your life like that, back and forward, back and forward. Well, we need to remind ourselves daily of the truth of who we are now because of what Jesus has done. To arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit. So when temptation comes, we now have to deal with it. Actually, this whole passage here is Paul arming the Ephesians with the truth of their position in Christ so that they would be encouraged in their walk with God. They would, be, they would become mature in their faith which is really actually the essence of this sermon series for us as a church. We want to become a resilient people. 1 Peter 1.3 says, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that Greek term for hope there in that passage means an eager, confident expectation. Unlike the empty dead hope of this world, this living hope is actually energising. It's alive, it's active in our lives and we should live with great expectation as the NLT puts it. Our living hope actually doesn't originate from uh, an idea but it comes from a living, resurrected, ascended saviour, Jesus Christ. That's who we hope in today. Only by grace. Well, finally, I've got one more point to pull out of this passage and so we're going to look at verses 8 to 10 together. says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. You see, this turnaround, this redemptive story Paul outlines to the Ephesians is laced with, it's held by, the grace of God. Verse five, by grace you've been saved. All of us should still by rights be dead to God, destined for an eternity separate from knowing him, from enjoying the life that he offers. Instead, actually, God's grace has enabled us to be rescued. And we've recently done a whole series on grace called Outrageous and it's on our website, wearelifespring.church. You can go there by looking at the sermons and find it. But simply this passage actually embodies it. We were helpless, we were hopeless, but God rescued us, redeemed us, raised us. Paul is making the point here that you can't get right with God by yourself. No, God chose to save you. Not only that, but he is crafting and shaping you to become more like Jesus every day. Again, the good doctor Martin Lloyd-Jones says, we must realise we are the workmanship of the great workman, the great artist. There is nothing more wonderful than this, that I, such as I am, am something that has been fashioned by God himself, that I am like clay in the hands of the potter. 
as I think of my Christian life in this world, I must stop thinking of it as simply in terms of what I do and what I am doing, but rather think of it in terms of what God is doing to me. That I am in the hands of the great maker, in the hands of the creator, and that he is working in me and upon me. What a wonderful statement that is. It's so freeing, actually. It, it frees us up from pride. It frees us up from comparison to one another. It frees us up from judgment. Actually, uh, the fact that we are in Christ and made to be like him, it enables us to love people like he loves them, like he loves us, because we get to see them as God saw us. And this should lead us to that place, uh, to a place of deep compassion and a sense of urgency, actually, to share this good news with those around him, around us to embrace the good works, actually, that Paul writes about that God has prepared for us in Christ. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long while. It's hard sometimes to remember, isn't it, what life was like beforehand. We get very kind of locked into um, maybe a little Christian bubble. And I think this is what Paul was doing here to the Ephesians. He's opening up their eyes again to say, this is what you were like. I often think about that when, I, when it comes to kids. I find it really hard to remember what life was like before having children. That's because I changed radically when I became a father. Something inside of me deepened. I got more emotional. I had a deepening of my ability to love. I also got a lot more tired. All of that actually makes it hard sometimes to relate to those younger married couples who always seem to have no time and are always at all full capacity. I've no idea how they feel it, but I have to remember what it was like before children to be able to empathise and relate to them rather than just dismiss them. And this is in some small way actually what Paul is doing here in this passage. He's reminding us, the Ephesians, those that are in Christ, what life was like before we came, uh, we became in Christ, so that we would have a great, greater awareness. Actually, one of our position in him, the fact that we are new creations now, that lens has changed. Two, his great love for us demonstrated by the cross. And three, the importance of sharing this good news with the world to have compassion for the lost. Our hope is in Jesus today and all that he has accomplished for us. He is actually the one that's resilient. He is the one that's constant and we get to be those two things because we are in him. And I hope today that your hope has been encouraged. And just as I was preparing this, I um, felt to, to lead us to a couple of places of response. Firstly, this morning, if you are feeling uh, uh, just a sense of despair at the moment and you don't know Jesus, the great news is this can be your story. This story of how you were once dead, now alive. This can be your story actually this morning. And all you have to do is to trust in Jesus. You have to say, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the things that I have uh, done that have offended you, that have gone against you. I lay them down and I now turn around and I follow you, Jesus. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. And He can change your life in a moment. One of darkness, one maybe of despair, maybe you're, you're struggling right now, even for purpose to live. In Jesus, you have a purpose. Not only that, you have a God that loves you for who you are, so much so that He came to this earth and died for you. If that's you, why don't you just take a moment and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for following the ways of this world. I'm sorry for living out a life that is in disobedience to you. And I repent, I say sorry. And I turn from that and I now say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to follow your ways. I want to be in you, Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian this morning. Maybe that uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story that I said, maybe that resonated a bit this morning for you. Maybe that's your life. One minute you're doing really well, doing all the things you should be doing. And the next minute you're back in kind of, you know, the mire and the pit and you live that kind of backwards and forwards life. Well, the good news is, is that we're only here, we're all here by the grace of God and God's grace extends to you this morning. And I felt that, that lens shift needing to happen for us this morning, that lens shift of rather than looking from earth up to heaven, we look from heaven down to earth. And that, that perspective, that, that change, that understanding that we are new creations, that we're actually free from that old way of living completely. We have victory over that. 
So I'm gonna pray now for you. If that's you, why don't you just do some business with God? You don't have to be in this room for God to change you. That's the wonderful thing about it. God is everywhere right now. God is in your room with you. And He wants to change you. He wants to bring freedom this morning. Father, we thank You for this story, this story of how You have raised us from death to life. And You've raised us up into the heavenly places that we are now in You, Christ Jesus. Our hope and our certainty is in You. And I thank You for the confidence and the empowering uh, nature of that statement, not even just as a statement, but as reality in our lives, that we have been changed radically. We are new creations. We have been re-engendered and made completely brand new. And, and so we, we actually get to live a life of freedom. And I wanna pray for every one of my brothers and sisters at home that is just struggling, maybe with an area of sin, maybe, just in, in whatever area, maybe having compassion for their neighbours, whatever it is, Lord God, I want to pray, would you come and, and remind them, show them afresh of their position in Christ. Lord, I pray for freedom to come right now, right across Horsham and beyond. Holy Spirit, come and breathe in your life. Come and breathe in uh, your freedom. Come break off chains. Thank you. Where your spirit is, God, there is freedom. And we get to live in that, Father. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this wonderful story, Lord God, of, of how we were saved by you, only by your grace. And we worship you, we adore you. Thank you, Father.